lesson. Our first reading this morning is Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look in the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come. Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and saw she saw a, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 10, verses 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master to the house of Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those in his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head will all be counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I, will, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Here ends today's readings from our Holy Scriptures. So may God bless this, our understanding of God's loving word. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Just testing. Good. A couple of times a year, 
In the course of our revised common lectionary, which is how I follow the Bible throughout the year and how I set my preaching schedule, we get some extremely challenging scripture. This week's Hebrew scripture from Genesis and this week's gospel lesson from Matthew both will challenge our interpretive skills and our faith skills. While Genesis tells of Abraham and Sarah's slave Hagar, the one who bore Ishmael, drawing the ire of Sarah and being thrown out into the desert with Ishmael to die, Matthew depicts Jesus describing himself as the root cause of some serious disagreement, dissension and dispute among faithful households. It wasn't until I actually sat down to write this sermon that I realized how challenging these scriptures really are. And it would have been nicer if I could have chosen different scripture, but I didn't. The really difficult scriptures that we have in this lectionary and in our Bible stretch us and they strengthen us. And I try really hard not to shy away from hard scripture, especially because we can learn some new things if we look at these scriptures with modern eyes. Now, our gospel lesson gives us an important message. Jesus tells his disciples that his very presence will split families apart. He understands that his sacred role, his controversial and political approach, will cause families to naturally disagree and to put distance between themselves. Issues of faith can often do this. But Jesus takes us to an even more challenging place. He tells us that faith in him is even more important than our loyalty to family. Now, I know this sounds scary, but Jesus tells the disciples and us to not be afraid, that by taking up our own cross and following him, we become worthy, and by sacrificing for his sake, we gain our lives. But that's not particularly comforting. <laughs> I'm not sure for me. Living a faithful life as we understand it with how God calls us to be, can be extremely challenging. And it can be difficult to thrive in a challenging environment in which we live. But we were created as faithful children of God. And sometimes, just by being ourselves, just by living faithfully, we might cause some conflict with those around us. It might be something we say, it might be something that we do that makes somebody upset but I have hope. And we can have hope that in the faithful living of our lives, the sacred life force triumphs always over adversities. A few years back, um, while taking our dog Lincoln out on some walks in the neighborhood, I began to notice things that were growing in places where it was very difficult to survive. And I've used pictures like these in previous sermons, but I brought three pictures with me today, each showing an example of life as I saw it growing in an inhospitable environment. This is a fern. Aside from the fact that we have a family inside joke that always is that this is a family reunion for the ferners. Um, this fern caught my eye because it's growing on a sheer rock face. It's growing in some cracks. There's no soil there. And there's not a whole lot of water either. Challenging living circumstances for sure. And it looks to me like it may never grow to full size, right? The ferns may always be small because of the nutrients or because of what they can get to keep them alive. But the life force in these ferns, as it was created by God, is very strong. So just being a fern on this cliff in the midst of challenge is an act of faith. Here's another one. Betsy will recognize that one, I think. This one amazes me because in addition to growing out of practically sheer rock, this tree also has obviously had to live with some pretty strong winds. It's bent over. If you look carefully, you can see that the wind has snapped off a good section of the top of the tree, and yet it continues to thrive. In very challenging conditions, it simply lives, being the tree it was created to be. I see this as an act of faith in the face of some pretty tough diversity. 
This last picture, though, is my favorite, and you might, many of you have probably seen this before because it just blows my mind. This is the one that got me thinking about life and living life in adverse conditions. And it's the one that showed me that life is literally stronger than death, stronger than any barriers that faithful living can actually lead to growth. Now, there's actually two plants here. There's one that I know is a wild blackberry plant, and there's another one that I really can't identify. It's, it's kind of jammed down on the right-hand side. It's a little dark. It's in a row of posts just across from the baseball field by Shove Park. It protects the old soccer field from cars that are traveling on Whedon Road, and you're not supposed to park on that side. I see life thumbing its nose at adversity, right? Growing in spite of limited sun, right? It's in the shade for probably 23 hours of the day, maybe less almost gets no nutrients. Can you imagine how much rain that thing gets in just a little six or seven inch hole? Whatever downpour it gets, that's the rain that it gets. But I know that barring any accident or anybody finding it and pulling it out, that the blackberry bush will burst forth into sunshine and be rewarded for its faithful act of living as it was created in the place that it was planted. Sometimes in our own lives, we're the fern, we're the tree. We are the blackberry bush planted somehow deep in a post, inexplicably. Adverse conditions don't have to stop us or even control us. Surviving each and every day, just being the person that God created us to be is living a faithful life. Hagar was surviving in the desert with Ishmael with the help of God like the families that Jesus said would be split over his very presence. We have sisters and brothers who struggle each and every day with adversity, and they triumph anyway. This gives me hope, and this gives me joy. This causes me to want to shout out to the world that life, no matter how improbable, always wins over adverse conditions, that love wins over hate, and that compassion wins out over selfishness. Now, there might be many examples of life triumphing around where you live or even in your own home. I urge you to look for them. Look for the weeds that are growing in the cracks of the hot asphalt, and they still blossom. They're everywhere. Reminders that God creates life, and in the midst of challenging circumstances, life wins. And we need not be afraid not for ourselves. We should be afraid for our brothers and sisters who might need assistance, who need some extra sunlight or rain or nutrients that we can give them. Yes, life can triumph over the most extreme environments, particularly when we help our neighbors. Extreme environments like heat or acidity or cold or dryness or darkness or emotional turmoil, but life and we learn to adapt to those kinds of extremes. But our love of God and our love of Jesus encourages us to find ways to lessen the extremes for our neighbors, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, even if others think that we might be wrong about that. Living our lives faithfully means taking risks. Jesus was clear that loving him means we might find ourselves in conflict with those who don't. That's okay, he says. When we live our lives for others, we gain our lives. Hagar found herself hanging, having to survive out in a harsh desert situation with her infant son through no fault of her own. And this story really deserves its own sermon. So someday I will try and talk a little bit about the impact of this Hagar story on our faith and on the faith of the Muslim faith because Lor has it and the Muslim faith claims Ishmael as their founder. The Muslim faith sees the son of Abraham, the first son of Abraham, through a slave woman as their early, early progenitor. Jesus was encouraging his disciples and us to take risks for him. The consequences may be potentially harmful or painful or divisive, but the rewards are eternal. We know that life can thrive in adverse conditions. We know that the world outside of these four walls have plenty of adverse conditions. We know 
that life can thrive. This brings me hope. It brings me joy. And for now, I know that no matter what conditions we might face as one worshiping community, you and I have God's help to get us through. Amen.